record. Um, the note 12 um, governs the uh, rules and uh, of uh, contribution and participation at IETF. Please get acquainted with it if you're not already. Uh, we have uh, we have virtual Bushit uh, today. Um, we are using the Etherpad uh, to log uh, and the uh, the attendance. Please use this uh, link. Um, we were uh, we were notified that there are two uh, URLs uh, for Etherpad. Uh, we are using this one, and uh, there is a note in the other URL for Etherpad to uh, use the proper one. Please make sure you sign in your name in the right one. Um, for asking questions, this is a little bit different than usual. Uh, we ask the attendees uh, uh, to use the chat and log a, uh, a plus Q letter for get entering the queue. Uh, and uh, one of the working group chairs will uh, manage and ask uh, uh, if the, uh, the the person to, to, to go to the mic and ask the question. We are also on Jabber, so feel free to use it. Um, and your questions will be uh, queued as usual. Uh, we ask please the attendees to join in and uh, contribute to the minute taking uh, at the Etherpad page. Uh, we have the slides and the URL there. Uh, you can get access to the presenter's slides. Uh, as usual, uh, the documents for the MPLS working group uh, are uh, at the uh, MPLS documents uh, page. Can, can you put these links in the chat? We can't cut and paste them from WebEx. I can do that, yeah. Okay, they should be on chat. Yeah, thanks. No worries. Thank you, AC. So this is our agenda. Uh, we published it earlier, and there's a slight modification for, uh, to it. Uh, um, we've we've been asked that uh, uh, to bring up a couple of the presenters at, uh, towards the end, bring them forward, uh, specifically. Uh, uh, presenter five and six, uh, uh, would, we're, are we going to move them to the top uh, uh, based on the request? They have to be present in, uh, uh, or they have to leave us earlier. So we will accommodate this. We have seven present, or actually six presentations and a status uh, group uh, update uh, that the chairs will go through. So we ask the presenters to leave some time or manage their time and leave some time for questions and answers towards the end. We've, we think we've given uh, the presenters, uh, you know, the time they asked. In terms of the, uh, the working group status, uh, have one reported error. It's a typo. Sorry, let me go back. It's a typo, and uh, uh, we I think we have, uh, we we acknowledge this, and it's uh, we're going to take uh, proper action on it. So the pop was expanded uh, incorrectly into post a uh, post office protocol, uh, while it's a pop operation. It was logged against RFC eighty two eighty seven. Um, we don't have any uh, liaisons uh, to MPLS or from MPLS uh, this time. Uh, that's a good thing. Bad thing. <laughs> uh, in terms of the document status, um, we have four RFCs that got published since last IDF. Um, um, we've been active there, so we thank all who contributed and. Uh, and the shepherd, as well as the area direct, uh, director, uh, for getting this ac accomplished. Uh, we have two documents in the queue as well to get uh, to be published. Um, uh, they are uh, one is in the MSREF uh, state, and the other one is in the RFC editor state. 
Uh, we should we expect them to be uh, published so, uh, soon. Um, in terms of the other documents, the, MPA, the working group documents, we have uh, one uh, that needs a revision, uh, the refresh independent RZP FRR. If the authors are present, we ask them to uh, take action on that. Uh, as well, we have the RMR and PLS RMR uh, document. Again, needs a revision. So, if the authors are present today, uh, we ask you to please uh, take action needed. The MPS SFL framework document. We have requested the uh, the uh, publication of this document, and uh, um, you know, please uh, stand by and uh, expect uh, follow-ups from IESG on this. We have new working group uh, document that got uh, adopted. Um, this is the uh, LSP ping OSP v3 and OSPF v3 and OSPF uh, points. Um, there is a little bit of discussion on this document. So uh, if the working group um, feels the, I encourage the participants to engage in that discussion. It has to do with uh, code point deprecation um, so, if you have uh, a certain opinion on that, uh, please sound it. That goes to the chairs as well. So, I. So, in terms of the updated working group documents, uh, we have the Yang document MPLS space. Uh, this is uh, this has undergone a working group last call, and there were a couple of comments that were addressed. Uh, right now, it stands. Um, uh, it, it needs to get uh, moving to working group, uh, to uh, publication. So we'll work with the shepherd uh, to get that uh, moving forward. Uh, the other documents uh, they are updated. Eric, yes. What, what we really need for the MPLS based young is uh, implementation information. We don't have anything. Although we need, we know. But there are implementations out there. So yes. anyone that have an implementation, please tell us. You can tell the shares directly if you don't want to tell this. Okay. No, yeah, yeah uh, th that's a good point. And I'm a part of the author, uh, authors, and uh, we meet uh, uh, to discuss the Yang modeling, and uh, we should we, we we should respond uh, by Friday, uh, upcoming Friday. We have a meeting and. I'm going to ask all the vendors uh, if if they have any support for any implementation of this model. From my, my side, um, yeah, I'll respond to your email uh, about the uh, implementation, Paul. Thank you, Loa. Um, the other documents they were updated, so we expect uh, a working group uh, report or status report for the working group documents. Some of them we've received. Uh, I'll go to, uh, through those reports towards the end. Uh, but as usual, if it is a working group document, we expect that the authors to send uh, periodic reports before the meetings. And you know, pl uh, please do that uh, for your uh, documents. Uh, recently expired documents. So these are uh, the working group documents, but they got expired. Uh, in fact, the last one got revived. Um, I know that, uh, but but we we ask uh, the authors of the other um, documents to um, send us a note if they are still interested in moving these forward. Uh, otherwise, otherwise we have to do the proper action, uh, terminate those, or they will move. Uh, they will be archived. We have new individual draft uh, documents. Two of them are on the agenda, so the authors will uh, talk more about them. Uh, we have updated internet drafts, some of which are on the agenda as well. Also have a document that is uh, uh, currently in, uh, in spring working group. The author uh, felt it's also related to MPLS, so we'll hear more about that on the agenda. Now I'm going to go through the re status report of working group documents that we received. Uh, the first one 
Um, uh, it, it has undergone a Yang doctor's review um, and uh, the, the, the comments were addressed. Uh, the next step will be a working group last call. The authors are asking us to move forward and uh, um, we will take the, the chairs will take the action on that. Uh, the second one, uh, I think we spoke about it. Uh, Loa had pointed out that we are, it, it's an IPR poll Im implementation poll. Uh, sorry, it's an imp implementation poll uh, right now and uh, authors need to respond if, or anyone in the working group that knows of an implementation, please um, do that as well. Next steps, uh, we will, uh, write, uh, the, sh we, the shepherd ha has to do a write up and we will move forward with the publication. Uh, the MLTP Yang model, uh, it's uh, the Yang doctor review at the moment. Um, uh, it, we expect some uh, uh, comments coming out and, uh, and the authors uh, to, to address them. The uh, next step would be a working group last call after that. Uh, we have the MPLS BFT directed uh, working group document. Uh, the status of this document is stalled at the moment. Um, uh, there was a RTG directory uh, review, directorate review, and, uh, and there were comments uh, that still are outstanding. Um, we need further discussion. We need this to get going. Uh, um, and so we encourage the authors, if they're present today, to uh, uh, continue to reach out to their viewers and uh, and and use the mailing list uh, to, to 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 send the status of these discussions. Next one is the MPLS RMR. Uh, I did mention that uh, we expect a revision of this uh, dra this draft, and uh, uh, that will address the comments that came out. Uh, and then uh, this will be uh, moving forward to publication after that. MPLS LDP RMR extensions. Uh, we are. Uh, we are waiting for the base RMR draft, which is the one in the middle here, uh, to move forward. So after that, there will be a shepherd write-up and a working group uh, last call uh, to move forward with the with the document. All right. Yes, please. On the last one on the previous page, I think that information is not correct. What we actually was waiting waiting for was the uh, RMR go to uh, uh, publication press. So we are, we are free to start working on the RMR extensions now. And I need to talk to the, uh, to the author. Yeah, so let me, let me repeat it again. So the last document here, um, LDP RMR, waiting on the base RMR uh, or draft, which is in the middle, to get uh, to publication, right? we waiting for that we ask for publication. I think we've done that. Yeah. Yeah, the, 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 yes. So it's, not, it's not waiting any longer. We have, we're ready to go. Okay. Okay, thank you. Right, so the next one we have here is a mid uh, working group document for MLDP. Uh, this was an expert review and uh, it recently expired. Um, uh, it's a little bit awkward state it is in right now. Um, uh, we are asking uh, for an expert review. The, 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 the comments that they got were addressed, but there's no follow-up because we don't have a replacement uh, for the expert review to acknowledge that they were uh, addressed. Um, um, Loa has more on the status. Um, do you feel do you feel you need to add Loa to this? So the history is that we have the MIBLOC and the MIBLOC is our 
thing the work they did on him. My mom. You're not too much audible for me, but I hope everybody else was able to. Uh, we don't we don't have a MIP doc so that actually can fill in. That's a situation. We're trying to solve it. Okay, I heard we don't have a MIP doctor uh, at the moment. We're trying to solve this, uh, and uh, I hope we are uh, we will we will be taking we will be taking uh, the actions needed to follow up. The next uh, document we have is the special purpose label terminology. Uh, it is stable. It is stable and uh, ready for working group last call. The next step is the, for the working group chairs to uh, move ahead with this uh, working group last call. I did talk about the last uh, document here, which uh, uh, which is which is tackling the code points, uh, some deprecation for uh, update to the code points um, for LSP ping for OSPF. It was uh, adopted. We invite more reviews to happen if, uh, and there is a discussion on that on. The mailing list. Uh, so please contribute to that if you uh, have any opinion uh, on that matter. Uh, next, we have the LSP ping registries update. Uh, the status of this is uh, we the authors are addressing some comments that were raised by Adrian. Uh, thank you, Adrian. And the next steps would be to move forward for working group last call. Um, the ITF and PLS uh, SFL framework, synonymous flow label. I mentioned that it is uh, in publication requested, uh, or we are waiting on a further review from IESG. And um, I think this is the last one here. Uh, it's also SFL related. Uh, it is ready for working group last call. Um, we, we have pointed out that uh, we have uh, many uh, uh, number of uh, many authors on the first page. So we've, uh, we're asking the authors to discuss it among, amongst themselves if it is possible to reduce the number of authors. And if you think otherwise, uh, please let the chairs know and uh, we will raise it up with the area director. And the next step would be to uh, move ahead with working group last call. Anyone uh, to... okay. I don't think we will. I think the working group share actually will take the position and appoint an editor. Let's say working group, working group share will actually take the position. Okay. Uh, I'm sorry, I can't, uh, I can't uh, fully comprehend what you're trying to say. But we, I uh, you said we. we... What I'm saying is that if the authors can't resolve this, working group shares will point, appoint an editor and then we go ahead. Okay, perfect. I can hear you perfectly now, Loa. Great. Thank you. Okay, so this is the end of our uh, uh, status report. Is there anyone uh, uh, in the queue for asking any question? Before we go ahead with uh, presenters, uh, no, okay. Okay. So next on the agenda, uh, as I mentioned, that there is a slight change to the agenda, and uh, um, I'm not sure if Kiriti has joined or Balaji. I think uh, so. We have uh, we have the this uh, presentation uh, as next. Uh, Balaji, you go ahead. Uh, can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you. Yeah, um, so Balaji will do this, but I'm here just in case. Okay, thank you, Kiriti, for acknowledging. Okay, so uh, this is uh, this is the uh, uh, label allocation using ARP. Uh, Balaji, uh, let me know, uh, and I can flip to the next page. Can you hear me, Tarek? Yeah, I can hear you. Okay, all right. Yeah, um, so... Before I start, Kiriti and Reggie, if you guys have anything to say, please feel free to chime in as we go through this. Um, yeah, so LARP is basically an extension to our protocol that allows creation of MPLS LSPs. In MPLS, we have a suite of protocols, right? Like LDP, RSVP, BGPLU, and so on. 
um, each protocol has a different set of characteristics, right? It has its own strengths and weaknesses. LDP, for example, is good at keeping state minimal, and but it can only create SPFLS space. Um, RSVP is pretty good at traffic engineering, but you know it has hardware when square problem in the transit. Um, likewise, LRP also appears in the line with its own strengths and weaknesses. Right? LRP is a very simple protocol because it's based off of ARP, which itself is a simple protocol. And it, it has its own weaknesses. Like for example, it's scaling, right? So that's what LRP is. Uh, because of its simplicity, it's applicable in two major deployment scenarios. One is in the MPLS data center, where, um, let's say, there is a server that's do, providing multi-tenancy, right? And in order to provide multi-tenancy, the server needs an underlay network, right? We have a host of underlay technologies, MPLS being one of them. If the server chooses MPLS as underlay, then it needs a way to create the MPLS tunnel, right? So it needs to speak some protocol to the network to create the tunnels, and LRP is an ideal choice between server and the network. Another use case is um, in the access network, if the broadband server is allocating uh, labels to subscribers, and one of the DSLAM sitting somewhere in the access network um, needs to get the destination, it can use LRP to acquire the label point. So many of you probably have this question in mind, right? This work was done about five to six years ago. Why are we talking about it now? Um, I think back then it was a little too premature because at that time, I think the prevalent uh, underlay technology was not MPLS. Uh, this is something that we are noticing is changing now. People are showing more interest in MPLS and therefore we think this is an appropriate time to bring this up again. Then if the question is, the question is um, how does the server acquire the label binding, right? Uh, typically, the server does not speak routing protocol towards the network, right? It may have a BGP version running in it uh, towards the controller. Uh, that's mostly for exchanging overlay routes. Um, the part that needs to be addressed is once overlay routes are acquired, um, how will the host figure out how to get to the underlay destination? Right. We're proposing that we use LRP for that. Next slide, please. Um, so at a high level, this is how the protocol works. Um, traditional R, one of the nodes in the network sends out a request and says, I'm trying to reach this particular IP destination. Whoever has this IP address, can you give me the... Whoever has this IP address, can you give me the MAC address for this? And whoever wants that IP address response, right? That's the traditional simple model of R. Um, there is a slight variation of this, which is called a proxy R, um, in which the node is allowed to respond to the R request, even if it's not the owner of the IP address. Right? Typically, this is done by routers. What LRP uses is the proxy R model, basically. So the protocol operation is pretty similar to R. An LRP client sends out a request and says, I'm trying to reach this destination. Can you give me the label? Instead of MAC address, it says, give me the label, right? Um, one of the LRP servers sitting in the network gets this packet. And when it sends the LRP reply, instead of the MAC address, it hands out a label. And that's that's basically the um, uh, nuts and bolts of this uh, protocol design. Can you go to the next slide, please? So let's uh, zoom into it a little more. In this diagram, you see um, there are three N nodes, X, Y, and Z, which could either be servers or DSLAM nodes. And there are T, uh, three routers, T1, T2, and T3, um, sitting in the border of the network, which could either be BNG servers or um, TOR routers, right, if it's in the data center. Um, let's say X wants to talk to Y, right? It wants to establish an underlay LSP to Y. Um, so X starts by saying, it sends out an LRP request and says, I need to get to Y, um, can somebody give me a label for it? That packet reaches T1 because ARP is a broadcast packet. T1 gets it, looks into its tunnel database. Um, for a second, let's assume that T1 has a tunnel to Y, right? So it assigns a label binding to the LSP to Y and installs a 
route entry in its L fib that says if the incoming label is let's say L1, right? Uh, swap it with L2 and send it to Y. And then it sends L1 to X. At this point, X is good to go. You can start sending packets to Y. Right. Uh, one additional aspect of this is um, if you see how ARP works, right? Basic ARP, when a node gets an ARP request, uh, not only does it respond with its own MAC address, it also learns the sender's MAC address, right? Likewise, in LR, when T1 hears from X, it also learns that X is present there and automatically assigns a label finding for X, which is sort of propagated into the network. And that's how, in the first place, T1 had an LSP to Y. It was propagated by T2 to OS T1 when Y tried to do something. Next slide, please. Some more details. Can you press space? I think that the three or four bubbles will show up here. Okay, one by one, please. Okay. Yeah. yeah. So this is the first one. Yeah. Right. So the um, some more details on what we discussed. Right. Um, where we said X asks um, for a label binding to Y. Right. Um, what prompted X to ask for a label binding to Y? I think. The answer to this question depends on what um, Node X is trying to do. If Node X was doing multi tenancy, for example, let's say um, the, one of the tenants had a few containers or VMs sitting in server and a few more sitting in another server. And if these containers or VMs try to talk to each other, then you know the two servers need to have an underlay tunnel among them, right? So maybe one of the possible triggers is. Um, if the overlay route present in the server says, I have an next hub pointing to that server, that could be a place where we, where the host actually sends out the alert request. Next point, please. Um, so the second aspect is we said T1 would, would look into its tunnel database, assign a label to that LSP and you know, create a route that stitches the two LSPs, right? And what if um, in the code you are actually doing Spring, right? Then in that case, you might have multiple LSPs. So this this concept is already supported by Spring. It's called binding set. Um, essentially, T1 allocates a label and that's a swap route into the LSP going into the core. Next point, please. Um, I think this we already discussed. Basically, this says, um, how does T1 know about X? I think we discussed that this is derived from basic art model. Next one, please. Um, also note, because we are using proxy R, X and Y do not need to be in the same network. This is, again, a property inherited from basic R. Um, next slide, please. So what do we need to do next? Um, last time we presented, we, we actually had some prototype implementation on Linux and on another operating system. Um, but it didn't go too far because at that time, uh, MPL support in Linux was not that great. I think things have improved significantly now. Um, I think we need to refresh our implementation to catch up with the recent state of affairs. And uh, we also need to flesh out more protocol details as to how the label metric um, entropy label capability, etc. How are all how are these properties going to be represented in the packet? Um, what if a server is multi home? Um, how does it choose the egress interface? Um, how does LR work in a spring network? Um, how do we deal with uh, does LR need to support label stacking, for example? Is bindings it good enough? Um, and as you guys know, most of the routing protocols have this graceful restart support where. Um, the control plane is allowed to restart while traffic is still flowing. Um, the similar capability is probably needed in LR2. Next slide, please. Anything if you want to say? Okay. Uh, we do we have any questions? Uh, I I do if uh, if I'm the first in the queue. I'm trying to look for the requesting. I'll decline. Um, yeah, I think 
Yeah, I found the person that needs to be muted and I muted them. They're logged in as IDR working group. Um, so uh, am I uh, in the queue? Yes, uh, Nick? Yes, go yes, go ahead. Okay. All right, uh, Balaji, I, uh, uh, my question is, uh, so ARP is a for, uh, for V4, uh, you know, uh, it resolves uh, IPv4 to Mac and, uh, and, and other networks may use uh, IPv6 uh, ND. Uh, this is the first question, what are your plans to address that, to distribute bindings in uh, V6 networks? Um, and the second question, um, um uh okay now i uh forgot the second question so uh, i'll stop right there please uh, uh go ahead and yeah i think kiriti had some thoughts on how to do ipv6 in lf i'll let kiriti answer that so um yeah thanks um um biology the plan is to use ARP um, because it's a very simple uh, request reply protocol. ND has other things um, overloaded on it, uh, which is, you know, what you need if you're a client in an IPv6 network trying to get uh, more than just um, how do I get to a particular uh, remote IP address. <clears throat> um, LR uh, wants to, I think, keep it really simple. Uh, just get uh, IP to uh, label binding. And so I think that works. Just set the proto uh, type to protocol type to IPv6 rather than IPv4. There's a code point for that in Ethernet. So that would work. Um, that's the current thing. I, I know IPv6 people probably uh, are looking askance at me, but that's, that's I think it, it's more suited. Thanks. Uh, when uh, did you want to comment? Uh, is that a question? It's a comment. And I, do you hear me? Yes, I can hear you. Go ahead. Yeah, it's a comment and a question. I, I see. I think I. It's perceived that ARP is easy to extend, and I understand the reasoning behind that. But I think if if we really need a lightweight protocol, probably we need even extensions in ARP beyond that, right? I think if we really want to go down this path, is it not better to define a very lightweight protocol, even maybe using your PC or something like that, where you basically request and exchange it uh, between two two uh, neighbors and be done? The thing is, ARP is a simple protocol. It does everything you want. And one other thing is that, um, you know, in, in a situation like in a data center where you have, you know, potentially 10,000 or more servers, um, you don't necessarily want to know where every other server is and what the bindings to them are. You want to be very prescriptive about that. And so um, uh, ARP allows you to, you know, only get the things that you want because you're explicitly requesting it. So it's like uh, um, LDP downstream on demand, except it's so much lighter weight than LDP and doesn't need an underlying IGP, you know, to work with. So, um, I, you know, yes, we could invent new protocols, and you know, in many cases, that's the right thing to do. Uh, but um, I think if ARP does the job, then we should just simply use that. But you know, I like inventing new protocols, but um, I think no, I'm I'm not see, I'm not for a new protocol, but I believe that ARP is so much uh, used in every stack that if you want to extend it, it's uh, you you are looking for trouble. I think at some point, I look for trouble. I like that. <laughs> yes, but it might be. The, the point either. is that you have a new hardware type, which is MPLS or MPLS over Ethernet. So um, everything sort of goes under that. And if you don't, uh, you know, so you don't mess the existing ARP, which is really important. So I agree with you that, on that. We have uh, other questions. Uh, I think uh, Joel has a question. Joel, Joel has a question. Go so ahead. If I assume that the servers are point to point linked to the first top router who will answer the ARP, then I understand how the various failure cases work. But if the top of rack thing is a switch and not doing the ARP, but rather connecting to some other router that's actually answering the ARPs, 
which is perfectly valid, then I do wonder what happens when there's multiple routers and some of them fail or if they don't all use the same label. Seems like odd things can happen in many topologies. In, in, in sufficiently constrained topologies, I get how this works. So uh, are, you gonna are you planning to just say this must be used only with this, this topology restriction or do you have a way to make it work when there's a layer two interconnect as well as layer three? So right now we were looking at the case where it's a layer three interconnect or point to point. Um, and that's, I think, the most common case in data centers, especially if you're going to move uh, to MPLS. Um, I think it's interesting to try to work out some of those cases, but um, I'm happy to stay with just uh, um, doing the uh, doing it, you know, on a point-to-point, -point, uh, uh, you know, a server-to-switch connection, to tower connections. Does the draft currently make that clear? It doesn't. Um, there is this question of, um, to your point about multiple labels, um, if you're multi-homed, which effectively, in the case where you're connected to a switch, uh, you could be multi-homed. Uh, you're effectively exactly. uh, connected to two different things. Um, that does need to be worked out. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Um, I uh, because you're next up. You're up next, Kirti again. Uh, um, I think there is no outstanding questions anymore, so uh, I can uh, uh, flash the next uh, set of slides uh, if you're going to present. Yes, I will present. Okay. Uh, are you able to see them, by the way? I am, yes, thanks. Okay, perfect. Thanks, thanks. please. So, um, this, this uh, draft was uh, joint work with Wen Lin. Um, she was looking at the problem of um, how do I deal with uh, a multi-homed EVPN uh, client and I'm doing fast readout. When the, when the CE goes down, um, there are certain issues. Um, so, and then we started discussing this and came up with a more generalized framework. So, next slide, please. Uh, when is online? So, if we have questions, we can definitely bring her in. So um, everyone knows fast readout. It's it's a really nice way of reducing packet loss when there's link or node failures. And in many cases, this is the reason why people deploy MPLS. But there are cases where MPLS may actually, I'm sorry, fast readout may actually make things worse. Um, so we'll look at some of those situations and then propose a solution using a new special purpose label. Next. Um, so here's a case where um, this is what Wen was looking at. I have a CE, CE1 that's multi homed to PE1 and PE2, and um, it's active active. So what you have is um, packets coming from uh, CE2 trying to go to CE1. Uh, PE3 can decide to go to uh, PE1 or PE2 and put the appropriate labels. Um, and then PE1 says, hey, since I'm multi homed, I can actually have a backup path in case my link to um, CE1 goes down. Um, I'll go via this other link I have or any path I have to PE2 and then uh, ask PE2 to send the packet to CE1. So it establishes this um, uh, protection path from PE1 to, PE, to CE1 via PE2. And similarly, PE2 does the same. So this is nice and this is a VPN fast reroute. Uh, this applies in the case of an EVPN or an IPVPN with multi-homing. Uh, the EVPN should be in active-active mode. IPVPNs are typically always in active-active mode. Uh, it could apply to VPLS, but um, typically VPLS are not run active-active. They run active standby, and there are certain issues if you run active-active. Next. Um, so the, the case here is if CE fails, if the CE fails, uh, PE1 will probably see this as a link failure and activate the fast readout. And so it'll send packets to uh, CE1 via PE2. Um, but PE2 will see the same thing. So what you, what you get is a packet goes from PE3 to PE1. Um, PE1 says, oh, I got to go via PE2. Uh, go, so the packet goes to PE2, then comes back to PE1 and just keeps going back and forth. So each packet will loop until TTL expires, and this whole situation will uh, continue until you know something happens that tells PE1, 
hey, it's not the link that's down, it's actually the C that's down. And often that's difficult to determine. Okay, we have someone. Who's uh, yeah, I think they're I'm not sure. To find, uh, Kiriti, I'm trying to find where the. RI is the one, I think. Who? CMRI, I think, is the one. Uh, yeah, yeah I, okay, they're muted now. Okay, thank you. Uh, go ahead, Kiriti. Okay, so so in this case, you know, the FRR, which is supposed to help you and you know reduce the packet drops, actually causes congestion on the path between P1 and P2, and also causes a lot of extra processing on P1 and P2. So it actually tends to be a bad thing. Next slide. Um, this is a case for NPLS transport. Um, essentially, you have a LSP from uh, P1 to P4, and you uh, set up link protection. So if the link between PE2 and PE3 fails at one, um, then I have a backup path via P5 and P6. And if the link between uh, P5 and P6 fails, I have a backup path um, via P2 and P3. Um, so normally what happens is packets go from P1, you know, all the way P2, P3, P4. If L1 fails, they'll go P1, P2, P5, P6, P4, P, uh, P3, P4. Um, but um, if you have a situation where L1 and L2 both fail, um, maybe because you didn't realize that they're actually um, sharing fate, or maybe that uh, information didn't get propagated to the past computation, then you have a situation where the packet goes from P1 to P2 saying, I'm, I'm trying to get to P4. P2 says L1 is down, so I'm going to go to P5. P5 says L2 is down, I'll go back to P, P2. And then the packet ping pong is there and can just that link. So um, here's another case where um, the fast readout, um, you know, normally helps you, but in this uh, maybe not very common case, uh, it actually hurts. Next slide. So um, in the case of RMI, you can you can um, do the build on the on the right, um, but in the case of RMR, I won't go into it in detail. Um, essentially, you have two counter rotating LSPs to every destination. So in this case, we're looking at the destination being node one. Um, and um, if if you're trying to get, um, can you just hit uh, next? Oh yeah. Um, yeah. If you're trying to get, uh, or keep going to yeah. Um, there's a couple more. Uh, if you're trying to get from node uh, five to node one and you're going uh, clockwise, um, you know, and, and then you hit a failure somewhere, you'll, you'll switch to the anti-clockwise. So that, that works nicely. But if node one itself is broken, then node five sends the packet to node one via in the clockwise way. Um, it hits node zero and node zero says, oh, this is not working. I'm going to uh, flip around and go the other way. And you go all the way around and hit node two, and node two says, oh, my link to node one is also broken. It doesn't know that it's also. So it says my link is broken, so it flips back. And so now you have this packets going back and forth around the ring. Again, uh, the fast read out uh, turns out to be a bad thing because you're now congesting the entire ring. Um, so there's some mitigations for this in the RMR graph, but not, nothing really you know, nice. So, um, so it's just another case where a better solution would be good. Next. So here's how um, things would work with without an FRR. Um, uh, you can you can build this out, um, Tarek. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so um, uh, there's nothing uh, unexpected here. Um, essentially, you know, we explained how this works, but I just put down a few labels here. There's a tunnel label uh, from P3 to uh, P1. There's a tunnel label from P1 to P2 and from P2 to P1. And then there's uh, uh, v, uh, the VPN labels. So I'll assume that you guys understand this and go to the next slide where um, we try to solve this problem um, essentially by saying, um, yeah, there's one more. Um, so here you have a loop, um, but uh, if, you, uh, if you're trying to do this with this uh, no further pass readout label, what happens is 
Uh, PU3 sends a packet to PE1 uh, with the outer label T, TL1 and inner label VL1. PE1 says, hey, I'd like to get to CE1, but I can't, so I'm going to send it to uh, P2 to try to get go via that path. And if L1 was broken and L2 is not, then this would be perfectly fine. But if C1 is broken, then uh, P2 also sees that L2 is broken. Uh, and so it would normally try to send it back. But what happens here is P1 says, I'm actually going to put uh, the, the label stack TL2, VL2, NFRR, uh, NFFRR. Um, essentially saying, hey, I've already done fast read out. If you get this packet and you can't deliver it, um, throw it away. The way it works is uh, with penultimate hop popping or whatever um, PE2 removes or already has TL2 removed, CSVL2 says, hey, I'm trying to get to CE1 because that's a label to get to CE1 via L2. Um, pops that and says, oh, there's one more label here, um, NFRR. So that means uh, NFFRR. I'll never get that right. Um, and so it says, I'm going to now, um, you know, it's the fast error has already been done, so I'm going to drop this packet. So instead of congesting that link L3, uh, the packet gets dropped at P2. And of course, all the extra unnecessary uh, kind of useless work that P1 and P2 would perform if the packet was pending. So, so basically, this is a special purpose label that can be used uh, in this context uh, to uh, indicate that P1 or somebody else has already done fast readout, and so a second fast readout may not be actually helpful. Um, next. So um, I guess the first question, so the request is that we allocate a special purpose label for indicating no further fast readout. Um, one question is, should we do a special, label, a special purpose label of any kind? Um, and uh, that's kind of addressed uh, in the draft. Um, it's it's good to have the semantic, um, you know, a, because it's it's a common semantic. So I don't want to have a different solution for VPNs and eVPNs and um, MPLS uh, transport and uh, MPLS rings. <laughs> it's, I think this is an important enough semantic that we should have a common solution. The second thing is why a special purpose label and not an extended special purpose label. Well, um, if you use uh, a label stack, as in, uh, you know, if the protection path, uh, like in the MTLS transport case, um, was actually a sequence of adjacency SIDs, then you don't know where um, the a second failure might happen. So you're, you're going to have to insert the NF NFFRR indication. And if that uh, is an extended special purpose label, you could be putting two extra labels uh, in the stack. Uh, uh, per per uh, adjacency said. Um, so so we do request uh, that we get a special purpose label. Um, we'd like to do an early allocation uh, with label value eight so that we can prototype this and see how it works in microcode. And there are a couple of questions. Um, you know exactly where you put the NFFRR label. Should you, should it be the bottom label in the stack in the EVPN case, or should it be the second label below the tunnel label, or you know, should there be some other place you put it? So, um, so I think uh, doing an early allocation will allow us to do some of that. Uh, next. And I realize that we have a couple of questions here, but um, um, I do think that uh, we should have discussion of this draft on the list. Uh, it's a new uh, draft and a new idea. Uh, and sort of the sort of next step beyond fast readout, which I think was a great thing, but it's been around for a while. Uh, we need companion documents to signal the ability to process uh, NFFRR, sort of like the uh, entropy label capability. This would be the NFFRR capability, and we at least need that in BGP and IGP, and we might need it in other things. Um, and then there is a question of when do you actually put an NFFRR label? What are the kind of computations you might want to do? What are the algorithms you might want to use? Um, if you use NFFRR all the time, um, whenever you've done a fast readout, even if a second fast readout won't hurt, um, then you get unnecessary packet loss. But if you don't use it, then you, know, you get the problem you have today, and that sometimes is worse. So I do think that um, you know, there is more work to do here. 
but um, we'd like to, um, you know, well, have that discussion, um, have, um, you know, there are some certain set of questions already here. I think Tarek, um, Loa, and Stuart, but uh, we should do more on the list as well. So, questions? Yes, thank you. Uh, actually, Greg is the first, and unless I'm mistaken, Nick. Oh, uh, I missed that then. I, I keep looking over, but I probably missed that. Sorry, Greg, go ahead. Okay. Uh, hi, Kiredi. Um, it's very interesting. Um, what I wonder is that um, have you looked at how um, OEM, our BFD, can be used uh, to um, help in this uh, scenario? Because I think that in a scenario that uh, you um, closely investigated uh, with uh, your home. Um, so you, we might expect that there is a session between PEs and CE, and then uh, there is a um, BFD session between, um, or not BFD, but OEM in the tunnel from P1 to P2 and P3 to P2. Um, so I, at least to the best of my knowledge of uh, BFD, uh, we can signal the failure on concatenated segment so that uh, the packets would not be sent uh, all together if both PEs uh, uh, connected to the C1 uh, will report the failure of concatenated path. Um, I'm not sure what concatenated path is, but, but I mean, the fact that um, C1 has failed is something that uh, both PE1 and PE2 can find out quickly using BFT or whatever mm -hmm. you're using. And now, um, so as soon as the packet hits PE1, it's going to be sent to PE2. Um, and um, PE2 is going to, you know, see it, there's a packet, doesn't know where it came from, and send it back to PE1. The problem is, um, you know, especially if there's not a direct link between PE1 and PE2, you don't know where it's coming from. So you don't know if it's coming from, you know, PE3 or PE4 or some other PE in the network, or it's coming specifically from PE1. And specifically because um, it was from you know a packet that P1 did a fast readout on, so we can uh, kind of uh, maybe invent some ways of doing this with OM, but that is a much more complex process, mm -hmm. and fast readout is happening very very fast. I mean that's mm -hmm. the whole point. So I think um, you know a data plane solution would be better, uh, and like I said, it's not just the P situation, um, I mean, the PEC situation in VPNs, it's also the NPLS transport. And uh, I don't want to make Tarek go back, but if you look at that slide, and you have uh, actually a failure instead of in L1 and L2, the links L1 and L2, you have a failure uh, in um, uh, P3, um, that looks like a failure both in the link L1 and the, thank you, Tarek, uh, the link between P6 and P3, uh, P3. And so again, that looks like uh, two failures, uh, but it's actually one failure of P3, of P3. And this will lead to a similar problem. Um, and so instead of trying to, you know, find point solutions for these, um, I think a first a data plane solution and second a um, you know, a solution that can be, can be implemented. Um, you know, more generally would be a good thing. But I appreciate uh, the comment and um, I also appreciate, Greg, that you're the master of OAM. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Uh, right. next, uh, I think I'm next in the queue. Uh, um, um, my name is Tarek uh, uh, with Juniper. So um, I think this is an important case uh, uh, that you're highlighting, Kiriti. Uh, um, and indeed, in EVPN, uh, you know, there is a, a potential that a loop can occur in that case. Uh, my question is, uh, you know, EVPN has uh, has capabilities to signal this split horizon group label to avoid, uh, you know, a, a flooded packets to come back to the access. It, it's it's not exactly FRR, it, it, it's, but it, it uses a mechanism to allocate a specific label to ask the other peer uh, in the multi-home peer to uh, drop in certain cases. 
uh, did you consider or are you considering to send signaling in, for example, in eVPN to allocate uh, a, a label, not necessarily the special label? Uh, and if not, why? why? So, when so is that? yeah. I can take that, Tarek. Okay, so first of all, the ESI label in the EVPN is to recognize the origin of the packet. So ESI in today's EVPN is to recognize the packet coming from CE instead of coming from under the PE. So we are trying to do FR. In this case, the traffic is coming from under the PE, not from CE. So let's put this ESI label aside. Secondly, the question is, it's a good question whether we can have another label to do this. We also have been thinking about this. This is, uh, uh, and the label can have, um, um, the scheme of label allocation can be per interface or per uh, table, right? Per rough table, EVPN rough table, or we, we, let's put a per Mac aside, okay? Per prefix aside, which is Mac. So reasonably is a per interface or per uh, verb. It's, it's very useful to do it per interface, but this will require every Ethernet segment, which can be in the service provider mode, a sub interface, right? Thousands of sub interface to have uh, under the label. So by, by using um, one general mechanism presented in Kareti's presentation, it's, we think it's a scale more scale like a scale up we only need to using one label to do this so yeah to, to answer your question yes it's doable to have an extra label but uh, to considering scale this is uh, one general mechanism one label so that's why we we went to we like to go with this approach thank you but, but when had done that homework and she had looked at different ways of doing this so Thanks, okay, very much. Thank you so much, Wen and Kiriti. Uh, I'm fine with that. Um, I think Stewart is oh, actually sorry. Uh, Loa is next in the queue. Yeah, uh, okay. Uh, I just have one. I say I want to say one thing, and I, you need to be careful. Kiriti, you was one of the co-authors of RC forty twenty, and you know that you can't early allocation if it's not the work group document. So we start saying label eight at this point in time and then in three or four months. There is a risk that uh, that something will happen to that label. So at least move to a TBD or something else. Take the value away. Uh, and I think it would take you three or four months before uh, we can actually make this a work group document. Sure, um, and um, I agree with all that. I put the request in now so that we can start thinking. We can get the you know expert uh, review done and so on. Um, we do definitely want to pr progress the draft as well. Um, and you know, from a private uh, implementation point of view, we can do some of these without that. But I think it would be nice because some of this code goes into microcode, which is not so easy to change. Uh, it would be nice to have the early allocation. So there's an early request for an early allocation. But I'll take I, 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 I agree to that. But I think you're playing a high risk game with starting to mention the value just now. Change that to TBD and we all fine. Okay. Okay. Got, got you. Okay, uh, I think next is Stewart. Right, so, so first, um, I, I support the idea of having a do not reroute again um, label in the stack. Uh, having an indication that said that we've already done repair and it shouldn't be done again um, is something that um, Mike Shand and I looked at many, many years ago when we were doing some of the very early work in this. And there were several schemes that we couldn't use because we couldn't reliably indicate whether a repair had previously happened. So I think a really good idea for us to add it. I'm a concerned about, uh, but it needs to be there for the general case, not just for any specific case. It needs to be a general feature that we add to uh, the scheme of things because there are many, many fast reroute schemes. 
I am really nervous about doing early allocation, however, because this is an incredibly uh, rare resource that we are um, um, using. And uh, we should be extremely parsimonious with it until such time as we know exactly um, what the scope of the label is and um, what the demand for it will turn out to be. What we don't, I think, don't have is an ex label, and maybe we need an experimental single label experiments to happen on. You were talking about microcode. Microcode is by definition changeable. So um, yes. I would hate to see us sort of burn the label and then make a mistake. We've already burnt at least one and there aren't. Okay. Uh, I have Mac, uh, Chen, next in the queue. Okay, this is Mark. I think I have a comment about this. Uh, about the application cases. I think this idea um, may work for the, some special cases, but it's maybe difficult to apply to a general cases, right? Okay, so, is that possible? Yeah, because if you, you don't know uh, the topology, it's, it's very dependent on the topology. True, um, the, the thing is, um, the probability of two failures is generally, you know, much lower than the probability of single failure. Although there are cases that look like two failures when they're actually a single failure, like the CE case, or in the MKLS transport case, it was P3 that failed. It looks like two failures, but actually it's uh, just one. Having said that, um, yes, it uh, does depend on the topology, and a little bit of that is explored in in the in the draft where there are actually three ways of getting from P1 to P4. Um, the numbers are, or the names are different in the draft. And so um, even when you apply the no further pass three route, um, because of load balancing, if you take a particular path, it says, yeah, this is fine, I'm gonna go there. Uh, and if you take a different path, it says, nope, that's not gonna work, so I'll drop the packet. So the thing is, by putting a, an indication of no further pass three route in the packet, um, you save the uh, uh, you know, potentially very bad situation. But uh, like I said, in the further work, uh, we do have to look at um, techniques, you know, algorithms and computation and stuff uh, that allow us to try to be a, you know, more selective about when we use it. Today, we don't have it at all. And I think that's pretty bad. Uh, if you use it all the time, that's, um, Slightly less bad, still bad. So maybe there's a better way of doing it. So I'm happy to, um, you know, do that exploration. Or if people want to do it, that's great. Okay. I think, uh, we're running a little bit late. Uh, okay. We have to cut it off. Uh, um, so we want to move on to the next uh, presentation. <clears throat> Thank you, Eric, for uh, moving me up. Um, <laughs> no worries. <laughs> No, but I, we encourage uh, you know uh, the participants to uh, you know take it to the alias and if you have any comments, remarks, or concerns, and uh, let's follow up on that. So next, I'm 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 presenting the uh, PDF slides. Um, uh, can I get an acknowledgement uh, first? Rakesh is next, and you're there as well as you can see your slides on. Uh, hi Tariq. Uh, hi everyone. Good morning. Are you able to see the slides, Rakesh? Yeah, I see the slides. Correct. Okay. So it's moving on its own. Yeah. Uh, hi. Uh, so uh, I'm Rakesh uh, presenting uh, this uh, draft on PM for segment routing with for MPLS data plane on uh, behalf of the authors uh, listed. Next slide. So uh, the draft has been around, but we'll recap the changes. Uh, so just a quick look at the requirements and scope, the history, uh, what we have changed uh, since the last presenta presentation. Uh, maybe quickly review the summary and uh, next steps. Next slide. So uh, this is uh, using uh, RFC 6374 and 7876 for uh, segment routing with MPLS data plane. Um, 
for delay and loss uh, measurement for links and the end-to-end -end, uh, paths, uh, advertising the link matrix uh, in the network uh, in the various measurement modes as defined in 6374 for one-way, two-way, and loopback modes. Next slide. So DAPT uh, has been around for a couple of years now. Uh, it was in spring, uh, six months ago, it was moved to the MPLS working group and it was presented in MPLS working group at the last ITF. Uh, next slide. So since uh, last uh, presentation, uh, uh, there are a few uh, changes made to the draft uh, address basically some uh, feedback and comments that we got. Uh, some changes in the two-way uh, measurement mode um, identify that some TLVs as uh, mandatory uh, change, change the handling of a address TLV. Uh, we don't have any open items at this point. Next slide. So uh, the, there are three measurement modes as defined in RFC 6374 and applicable to SR policy or um, SR pass as well. Um, using IP UDP for a one-way mode, uh, using the 6374 in both directions for two-way. Uh, we have um, clarified using a control code for two-way mode and uh, there is written path TLV as well. Uh, if uh, there are cases where we want to measure um, two-way mode for bi-directional SR policy, for example. Um, and uh, look-back mode basically carries the label stack for the forward and reverse path uh, in this case. Thanks. Uh, the next slide. So as mentioned, the return path TLV for two-way mode um, there is the, the uh, segment uh, list labels to be binding seed. And we identified it's a, it's a mandatory TLV. And uh, if it's uh, not supported, then um, there is an error defined in 6374 for unsupported mandatory objects should be uh, must be returned. Next one. Uh, there is a block number TLV uh, defined. Uh, it's used to correlate uh, data on both endpoints, like counters, uh, also to aggregate um, PM data at some interval. Uh, it's also mandatory, and um, if it's not supported, um, error should be, must be returned. Next one. So th there is a destination address TLV defined in 6074, and uh, the delay and loss measurement use cases in segment routing. Uh, the, the intended node must uh, uh, reply uh, on, only if it's matching the destination address, otherwise it, uh, it must uh, return an error. Uh, this is to avoid uh, any um, uh, miscalculation uh, uh, of metrics and affecting the segment routing. The routing decisions are made based on this, so it's a must. Next one. So welcome your comments and suggestions. Um, draft has been around for a couple of years and there is an implementation as well. Uh, draft was in a spring working group for, uh, for a while and um, this is the second presentation in MPLS working group. So we are um, requesting uh, the adoption in this working group. Yeah, next slide. Uh, I think that's all, uh, so, uh, thanks. Um, no worries. So you're asking for uh, proceeding ahead with the adoption of this document. Um, I, I don't know how to do a poll of uh, how many read the document on WebEx. Uh, so uh, I think uh, we'll have to take it to the email list and uh, you know and uh, and and move forward with the uh, regular process and MPLS working group with a review team. Uh, expect the review team. Uh, uh, to take a look at your uh, document and review it, and uh, and uh, moving forward with this, uh, I I let me see if there are questions. I'm not able to. No uh, questions. Notes. No questions. Fine. I no questions at all. I would like to add a, myself as a question. Uh, so let me uh, 
add that for the record. Um, my question to you, Rakesh, uh, there, this, this was asked last time, I believe, uh, the return path PLV, there is a mention in, uh, in other IETF drafts, uh, specifically in OAM, uh, for this refer, return path TLV, are you working with other drafts to, um, you know, uh, is there a possibility to unify this or is the, or you're thinking they are separate uh, return path TLV uh, for OAM or BFD, I think it was, is different from this uh, loss measurement or delay measurement. Yeah, yeah, this was asked last time. So what we did is we made the structures and um, uh, definitions uh, similar to the other uh, protocols, uh, but the scope of this draft is SRMPLS. So the code points that we define here are for SRMPLS. Um, but uh, yeah, I mean, if there are other drafts, uh, if if you if you ever ex extend this for some other use cases, then new code points could be defined for that. Okay, thank you. All right, I'll. Uh... I'll move ahead if there is no other questions, or maybe there is. Uh, I think Greg is next. Yeah, um, uh, Nick, uh, thanks for uh, uh, mentioning other work. Yes, uh, I think that um, what's being here uh, proposed is um, very similar to what in the working group document on BFD directed. So where the label stack uh, is advertised, and it's a similar um, uh, to the work being uh, discussed in the spring group. So um, definitely would be good to work together and try to come up uh, with a more generic solution. Okay. okay. Thank you. Thanks, sir. All right. Uh, um, thanks, Eric, for the tip uh, to the. Uh, uh, to the host and the uh, peers. Uh, we'll do it next time or next uh, document. So, Rakesh, you're still on, uh, and I am presenting your next slides. Yes. Uh, yeah. Uh, hi, yeah. So, um, I'm Rakesh again. Uh, this is an uh, enhanced um, uh, Performance measurement and liveness uh, monitoring in segment routing net network. We're introducing this uh, 00 version draft um, and uh, presenting on behalf of the authors listed. Next slide. So, agenda will look at uh, the requirements and scope, uh, the summary of the proposal, and the uh, next steps. So uh, uh, requirements uh, uh, is doing uh, performance measurement as well as the liveness monitoring in SR networks. So basically in parts uh, for SRMPLS, SRV6 data planes. Uh, the, today's uh, focusing on SRMPLS, it's MPLS working group uh, um, uh, session. Uh, also support SR, ECMP, SR parts. Um, and the idea is to uh, uh, run a single protocol for both liveness and performance measurement in SR networks uh, to simplify the deployment uh, as well as reduce the operational complexity. Uh, we're trying to eliminate the dependency on the endpoint on the you know, remote side, uh, no, no state on the endpoint, um, so it's not aware of the protocol. Uh, also, the, the requirement for scales much, much higher now uh, and the faster detection interval uh, requirement as well. So we try to avoid, you know, packets um, not punted out of fast path on the, on the remote side uh, to, to, to achieve uh, so the scale and the interval. Um, the current proposal is to use the TWAP light and the stamp uh, uh, messages. Um, it can also be extended to other probe messages in future and uh, basically using the user configure the IP UDP paths for the probe messages. Uh, next slide, please. So uh, liveness monitoring uh, for SR policy and ESR path, it uses loopback mode. 
Uh, Lookback mode is currently not defined for T1 Plight or Stamp uh, in, the, in the existing RFCs. Uh, so this introduces this mode and um, yeah, basically the probe messages are sent using the segment list uh, in case of SR policy candidate paths. Uh, they are uh, not punted on the uh, reflected node. Basically, uh, they come back, um, uh, look back. Uh, so endpoint uh, in this case is not even aware of it. Return path can be IP or SR. And uh, uh, just like uh, any other liveness uh, monitoring scheme, if you don't have a consecutive end number of messages received back, then you declare liveness uh, failure. Rakesh, sorry to interrupt you. I, I do have to flag that we're running a little bit behind and we still have two, uh, present, two uh, sets of presentations, including yours. Um, so if you can make it a little bit shorter or, you know, um, presentation to move on to the next one, I much appreciate it. Yeah, sure. Yeah, next slide, please. So there is an enhanced uh, lookback mode defined. Uh, works the same way as lookback mode, except there is a network programming function enabled on the reflected node. So when um, it detects uh, um, match, in this case, MPLS uh, label, uh, could be special label, uh, it will also insert uh, receive timestamp in the pro packet uh, before forwarding it. So idea is to you know uh, timestamp and forward the packet on the endpoint node so now you get T1 and T2, uh, and the liveness works the same way, but now you also have the uh, delay measurement between uh, the sender and reflector. And next slide, please. So uh, if you're using T1 light probe messages, um, the sender would add the transmit timestamp, uh, reflector would add the receive timestamp at offset 16. Uh, this is enabled by the network programming function on the reflector node. Uh, many fields are not used in this uh, message, um, not required. Uh, next slide. Uh, same uh, thing for stamp as well, so we can skip it. Uh, next slide, please. So for SRMPLS, uh, an example probe message would look uh, uh, like this, where you have a label stack, uh, and at the bottom there is a timestamp label. Uh, and the written path is IP. Uh, here, the endpoint and sender addresses are swapped, uh, so IP will come back to you in the back mode. Next slide, please. Uh, just like uh, other SR policy PM, uh, uh, this also allows us to uh, handle the ECMP paths by using the 127 uh, uh, slash 8, uh, the hashing those um, destination addresses. Uh, and uh, also for IPv6, we can use flow label. Uh, next slide, please. So uh, it, it's based on the user configured UDP path, so a controller or any SDN can be used um, to provision on the sender and reflector side. Only thing, uh, if you're using enhanced mode, then reflector side, the time set offset is provision. Next slide, please. Let's short, please, Rakesh. Okay. Yeah, that's it. <laughs> So uh, we welcome your comments and suggestions, uh, and uh, we would be uh, requesting a uh, working group adoption um, once we address all the comments. Um, okay, and uh, uh, we will follow up uh, on email this time uh, to save on the time. Um, <clears throat> we still have two uh, presentations. Uh, uh, it's still the presentations, I will go fast on this one. Go ahead. Uh, actually, yeah, if you can make it very short, uh, because we want to give a chance to the next uh, presenter, uh, much appreciated. Yeah. So, uh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, so Rakesh, uh, again, from uh, Cisco, uh, this is in situ OEM uh, for a PLS uh, encapsulation, uh, presenting on behalf of the authors. Next uh, slide, please. So we will look at the requirements, scope, uh, history, uh, last updates, and next steps. And next slide, please. So uh, there is IP, IP, IOM work being done in IPPM working group, and we're just uh, adding the MPLS and cap for it. Next slide, please. The draft has been around uh, for a year and a half now. It was in spring and got moved to PLS working group. Was presented last time, so we'll only discuss the delta since the last meeting. 
Thanks. Next slide. So the NCAP is made generic to MPLS data plane, uh, added procedure for hop by hop IOM and address various review comments. Next slide, please. So uh, as uh, presented before, there is an IOM indicator label to indicate the IOM metadata present. Uh, next slide. And, uh, there are two labels, uh, one for the edge to edge case and one is for hop by hop uh, processing. If you want all nodes to process, uh, there is a, a separate label for it. And uh, next slide, please. Uh, there is a, another flow, a label defined to indicate IOM and flow type. This is to address the ECMP um, case for IP header. So this way, the, I, the next four, four uh, bits are 000, and the IP hashing um, will ignore the, the not mess up because of IPv4, IPv6 um, misunderstanding. Um, next um, slide. So there are many ways to uh, allocate um, um, uh, the labels. We can we can skip this slide. Um, yes, uh, yeah, in peace. Anyway, then it's mentioned in the draft. So next slide, please. Okay, good. Um, so it's it it's uh, we're asking ion allocation from extended special purpose label, but it can be uh, controller allocated or signal. Next slide, please. can skip this and this as well then we go to the next steps yeah and uh, we we're looking uh, we solicit your uh, comments and suggestions uh, for this draft okay thank you and uh, any questions on uh, this draft uh, we have one from greg can you please make it uh, quick uh, we want to leave some room for the next presenter Uh, sorry, it was uh, okay. I'm sorry. Uh, it was uh, to the previous draft, but let's take it everything to the list. Uh, my apologies. Thank you, Greg. Thank you. Thanks a lot. Uh, wait, Thanks, Greg. Wait, uh, thank you, Rakesh. Uh, uh, we're moving ahead to the next slot. Uh, wei Cheng, uh, you're up next. I am presenting your slides. Can you acknowledge seeing them? Hello, can you hear me? This is Wei Chang. Hello? We can hear you. We can hear you, yes. Okay, okay. So, uh, yeah, please, next page. Yeah, so uh, this draft uh, is a 03 revision draft, and uh, uh, we have uh, several uh, major changes according to the comments received previously. The first one is uh, we change uh, from the base uh, special purpose labor to the extended special purpose labor. And the second one is uh, change the definition of the flow ID labors, TC and uh, TTL, to make them uh, compliant with uh, IFC uh, 30, 32. Uh, and the text on comparison with the uh, MPRS in situ uh, OM. Uh, and the last one is uh, and some text on the security consideration. And the uh, next page. So uh, uh, this page shows the flow based uh, performance measurement encapsulation in a uh, composite special purpose labor uh, we, the, the, with the extension labor 15 plus the flu ID labor indicate, uh, followed by uh, flu ID labor. Uh, the flu ID labor is used as MPRS flu indication. Uh, the TC and uh, uh, TTL of the flu ID labor uh, emitted that uh, of uh, uh, interpol labor, uh, except that uh, TC of the flu, flu ID labor is uh, recommended as a uh, uh, color making, uh, color marking field. So next page. Uh, 
So for the measurement uh, objects, uh, we can uh, include the LSP VPN uh, as well as the LSP uh, and the VPN. We can add the uh, CSPL uh, into the uh, LSP stack uh, to monitor the LSP uh, performance. We can also uh, use that uh, for the VPN and uh, uh, for the both LSP and the VPN. So next page. So this uh, slide shows that uh, the comparison with the in situ OM, uh, the major differences between uh, the both solution, uh, there are two uh, points. The first one, uh, MPR's embedded performance measurement doesn't introduce any new header, uh, whereas MPR's EC2 OM uh, needs a new height, uh, which means uh, maybe additional basic requirements. And the second, uh, second point, MPR's uh, inbound performance measurement allows uh, the network node to report the refined data. Um, for example, the calculated performance uh, metrics. Uh, associated with uh, specified flu, whereas um, MPRS in situ OM uh, requires the network node to report the data, for example, the ingress interface and the egress interface uh, data associated with the specified uh, packet. So, uh, this is uh, uh, the two key differences between the two solutions. The next page. So we also found the security consideration uh, in this new version. And uh, the major points uh, on the consideration including the first point, the Flu ID labor indicate and the flu ID labor must uh, not be uh, singled and distributed outside uh, one performance measurement domain. And the second point uh, is that uh, uh, to prevent uh, packets carrying flu ID labor from uh, leaking uh, from one domain to another the domain boundary nodes should deploy some policies, such as some special ACL, to filter out the packets. So, uh, next page. So for the next, next slide, uh, uh, we also uh, believe uh, all the comments uh, we have already received uh, have been uh, resolved. So we hope to ask for working group adoption. Uh, that's all. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, as uh, as mentioned earlier, we will uh, take it to the uh, to the list uh, uh, to do a poll of uh, interest from the working group, and we will move uh, accordingly uh, to adoption. Um, we d we did make it on time. I thank everybody for uh, st well uh, sticking to the agenda and um, making it on time. Um, uh, as a reminder, we will have a session two. It will be on May seventh. Expect some email to come uh, uh, to remind about that. Uh, thank you for joining this time, and uh, and uh, we're looking forward to seeing you again next time. I'll stop the recording right now. Thank you.